Today I'm going to be taking a look at one of the newer releases from Grand Seiko. It is a watch that I very much like and is probably one of my favorite Grand Seikos I've had hands on time with. So let's take a closer look. So we have a diameter of 38.5, lug to lug of 43, height of about 10.4, and a lug width of 19 millimeters. Some other general specifications for the watch, we're going to have the Caliber 9R31 movement being away in here, very nicely finished, hand brushing, and all these blued screws, very interesting layout that's not a kind of traditional Swiss. We do have a sapphire glass on the back, sapphire glass on the front that is actually domed. 30 meters of stated water resistance with a regular push-pull crown, and other than that, the watch retails for $8,500. You technically have to be a member of the GS9 Club to be able to actually purchase this watch, and I believe most of them are already sold out. Uh, maybe if you're part of the GS9 Club and you contact a boutique, you might be able to get one. But as you can see, only 299 pieces, so there aren't many out there. So starting off with the dial here, we have what Grand Seiko calls their Cure Zuri dial pattern, but this is uh, kind of done in a variation we haven't seen before. The more usual Cure Zuri patterns are a little bit more fine, a little bit more thread-like, but this one, while although of a similar pattern, when you see uh, us zoom in a little bit closer, you can see there is a little bit more defined, almost pebbling to it. It is a little bit more three-dimensional, and it is just a slightly different take on what the pattern has been in the past. Looking a little bit more generally, we do have Grand Seiko here at the 12 o'clock with the applied logo and the writing just under there. We have just Spring Drive alone at the 6 o'clock and then Japan and some other text here at the very, very bottom. Very clean, not much text, and honestly, they didn't need to add anything else there. Looking at the markers here, we have trapezoidal markers everywhere, and at the 12, we have a double marker. It is a very interesting look. It's not a shape you usually see in watches, but it's nice because it draws your eye in almost towards the middle of the dial and makes you want to look at the pattern more, makes you want to look at just kind of what's going on and obviously kind of <laughs> look at the hands and actually tell the time. You, of course, have the classic Grand Seiko sword style hands, very nicely faceted. And the tempered seconds hand here, of course, with that beautiful spring drive sweep. Interesting to note, and you'll see it a little bit more once we zoom in, but the hand is blued, the spring drive text, and the seconds track are all done in a blue tone. Uh, it's very interesting, something you kind of haven't seen done before with Grand Seiko. They usually don't take a lot of uh, colorful aspects to the dial outside of maybe just the dial itself. But here we have a little bit of accent coloring matching along these blue tones. And then you can see the outside seconds track here is not done in the Kirazuri pattern. It has this almost little bit more of a circular brushing to it that's very, very fine. And it helps contrast and frame the actual Kirazuri middle dial very, very nicely. I really like the simple clean dial here. It has a lot of dimensionality to it, not only from this very subtle sunbursting Kirazuri pattern that goes from darker gray to almost like beige is very gentle brown tones depending on the light but the watch is also very interesting in the fact that not only is the crystal curve and the dial is curved but the hands themselves also have a curvature to them to basically follow the rest of the dial and it is a really nice effect it just gives it a little bit more i guess you know oomph than a regular flat dial does and it is just a really nice design point so taking a look at some shaded natural light, we see that the dial can change a lot in its color. In more uh, kind of direct facing, we have a subtle-ish gray tone, and then at off angles, we get this darker gray tone that comes out. And then as you move it, the sunburst pattern appears and disappears, the texture appears and disappears, the indices go on and off in terms of like how bright they look. It is just a very dynamic dial as you move it, and it's nice to see. Looking at it a little bit more dead on, of course, you can see the pattern a little bit more. The quote unquote like cross hatch pattern of the texture itself pops out at you just slightly more. And it is just a very interesting dial. In some more direct light, we can see those more yellowish golden tones come out of the gray a lot more. Of course, the pattern itself becomes a little bit more apparent because it's almost like it's being lit from the back now from the light. Very interesting dial to look at, very interesting dial in the light, and it really is dynamic from the shade to the sunlight. So taking a closer look at the dial here, we do see we have very classic Grand Seiko perfection. Uh, the logo here is done in this very nice three-dimensional black ink that really pops off the dial and just has a lot of dimensionality to it. The applied logo itself, while not as faceted or anything, does just have a very nice clean polish to it, which does pop out nicely in the light. Moving on to the markers themselves, of course, so multifaceted. They do play with the light like crazy at every angle. You can see there is a facet in the front, facets on the side, and then more of a flat facet in the middle. So there are so many angles, so many surfaces for the light to just keep reflecting, keep playing with uh, just your eye and just the light sources around it. What I do really like about what Grand Seiko does when they do these multifaceted markers with the high polish everywhere is that 
at some angles they can go completely black where other uh, markers will have a complete shine to them and others will be half shiny, half dark. And it just gives a lot of life, a lot of reflection to the dial. And it just really does give a very, very living quality to the watch. Focusing a little bit more on the pattern, we can see it does have this very, very tight, almost fabric type weave to it. Uh, but you can see there are certain sections like here where you can almost say there is a little bit more like pilling. There's a little bit more three dimensionality to some of those uh, strokes or marks or however you want to, you know, identify those little pieces on the dial. And it just is a very interesting effect. It's something that you don't really notice until you're up close, but you can almost kind of make out with your eye as you're looking at it. Something that's awesome about this dial because you do have the very subtle sunburst effect to it is depending on the angle you get these lighter shades, you get these darker shades, uh, but it kind of flips and flops and then some areas that were previously too dark and kind of uh, harder to see the three dimensionality of pop out and give you a little bit more life. So it really is an ever changing dial and it's something just nice to have on wrist. Focusing here, you can see that kind of more concentric circling graining pattern to the seconds track. And on top of it, you have the very three dimensional uh, blue printed markers there. Very nicely done. Uh, it is kind of an odd choice to go with the blue. I mean, it does tie into the seconds hand, but it's not something I overly notice, but I guess it's not bad that it's there. And looking at the classic Grand Seiko hands themselves, you can see they are very, very highly polished, highly faceted. It is nice because of course it's polished on both facets. There is no brushing here, but because of the light play and the fact that they are facing in different angles, you do kind of get one part that almost always lights up brightly and one part that is almost always dark. So it really gives you a nice contrast, some nice visibility of the hands, and it makes them, in my opinion, very legible. The same story can be seen here on the minutes hand. You can see this middle portion kind of fades away towards the end and just becomes a bifaceted tip, very nicely pointed. And of course we have the very smooth spring drive seconds hand, very nicely heat blued. Some angles it looks black, some more it's more electric blue, and it is just very nicely done. Of course, center cap pinion there, which just ties it all together very nicely, makes it a very clean presentation for the dial. And really, there is nothing I can say bad about it. It is very nicely finished. It looks great under macro. There is just a lot of clean elements going on. And because you don't have the power reserve meter on the dial, because you don't have a date, it is just overall a very clean watch, which lets the finishing shine. One thing I will note, and it's a little hard to see depending on the angle, but you can see right there on the seconds hand, there's like a little tiny mark. I don't know if it's a hair or if it's a scratch or whatnot, but this is one of the first, you know, slight imperfections I've ever seen on a Grand Seiko. So just keep that in mind. Even Grand Seiko isn't perfect. There are humans making these machines, but I mean, for how good the rest of the QC on the watch is, this is, I think, fairly forgiven. So moving on to the case of this watch, and I do really like this because it's very, I think, unique to Grand Seiko. There aren't a lot of cases like this. It's very short, it's a little bit bulbous, but it's very thin, so it wears very well. It technically is, you know, a 10 millimeter and change watch, which isn't overly thick on paper. There's micro brands which make thinner watches than that. But because the way the case is constructed, you have this very large chamfer here on the underside, which not only rounds out any sharp edges, but kind of visually thins out the mid case more. You have a very visually thin brushed mid case, and then a very thin bezel with a domed crystal, which kind of doesn't protrude too much. You have what appears to be a super, super thin watch, and it wears very thinly on wrist. Looking a little bit more generally, we do have just pretty much high polish everywhere from the front. Of course, have that brushing in the middle, which I do think is just basically to break up the case visuals and make it feel thinner. I have, of course, a Grand Seiko signed crown. And looking at the watch, kind of, I guess, from this angle, you you can see like the more you move it, the more the watch just turns into one complete curve from end to end. And it's nice because again, you have the curve down from the lugs up into the crystal. And then as you start moving it this way, you can see the dial has a curvature too. So just following this line here, it's just very continuous. The watch it, design is at harmony within itself. And I think it just comes together very, very nicely. It almost would have been better if there was some more, I guess, like rounded-ish elements on the dials, like if there were more kind of baton style markers or whatnot, but that's just not something Grand Seiko does, so we can forgive them there. So taking a look at the movement here, we can see what I think is a very, very nicely done movement. It is at first something that I guess we're not used to seeing. It's almost very simple, uh, but it's what goes into the finishing and the accents that it kind of uh, draws your attention to that make it so nicely done. There is no separation of bridges. There's no uh, three-quarter plate or anything like that. This is a for fourth plate, you know, this is a full plate on the back of the watch and it is just fully linear brushed in a horizontal fashion 
done by hand. So it, you have that hand done component to it. You of course have the power reserve on the top here, which is also a heat blued indicator. To give this a very premium luxury feel, we not only have all these very high polished chamfered edges uh, for all the holes that see through to the underside of the movement, to see through the jewels, to see through some of these uh, kind of lower components, even like the glide wheel right here, you can see through the opening. We also have along the barrel, some beveling that's really highly polished and it just is something where as you move the watch around, it catches the light, it really comes to life. The brushing itself kind of goes from very dark gray to light gray, it has a living nature about it. And I just do think it's a very pretty movement uh, and I don't really have any complaints. Would it be nice to see a little bit more of the inner architecture? Sure, but I think this way almost leans itself a little bit more to classic Japanese austerity. It's very simple, very clean, very no nonsense, but finished very well. And then depending at the angle I hold the watch at, I can try to see if it pops out. There is a ghosted Grand Seiko Lion logo and it's not wanting to appear right now. You can kind of see it there, but I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little bit more. At this angle, you can see the ghosted Grand Seiko Lion a little bit better. Um, it is very visible in person as long as you have it at the right angle, it's just kind of hard to capture on camera, but it is cool that it's there and I think this is a very good execution, a very nice and premium way to do it rather than a kind of more golden stamped logo. Zooming in, we can see the brushing is very finely done, very nicely done. The uh, hand carved jewel holes are very nicely done. Uh, the heat blued screws, there aren't really any blemishes on those as well. The jewels underneath add a nice bit of color to the rest of the watch. So again, I do think this is a very premium looking movement. I do really like how it's finished. And of course, there will be no denying that it has a little bit of resemblance to the Crator H movement. You can just look that up or maybe I'll include a picture right here. And even these tiny little jewel holes, although they don't kind of fulfill the rightful purpose they're supposed to, but in some of the 9R movements, this kind of is supposed to represent a frog's eye looking up towards the bellflower, which this is supposed to be more of a skeletonized bellflower barrel, but because it's not $40,000, it is not skeletonized. Uh, so it's cool that you have these little aspects of the uh, history and story that the Crator movements have in it, but at a more affordable, more attainable price point. Zooming in a little bit and trying to get the right angle, you can see the Grand Seiko lettering there, the actual uh, power reserve meter, even this tiny little 37 joules text, they're actually all engraved down into the plate and then filled in with this blue coloring. So to me, not only does that add a lot of depth and just lovely finishing to the movement itself, but it just feels a lot more premium rather than they had just uh, you know printed it on there in a very plain text. It is going the extra mile, doing the extra step, and I think it is really well done. So moving on to how this watch wears, earlier I was wearing my Breguet Tradition here, and by comparison, this is a 38 millimeter watch. And here we have the 39 millimeter Grand Seiko, or technically 38 and a half, sitting on my six and a half inch wrist. And as you can see, very thin on the wrist, very comfortable, really no daylight shining through. It does just conform perfectly. Very short lug to lug, so it does sit within my wrist bounds pretty well. If I move it up here, I have closer to a six inch wrist and it wears still very well. You could probably go down to five and a half, maybe even five inches, and it would still look pretty proportional. The strap I think is paired perfectly. This dark gray really plays off the lighter gray tones of the dial. Feels a little bit more casual than had they gone for like a brown or black leather strap. Uh, of course it is on the longer side, it just, I me, mean, I have a small wrist. This execution of a deployment feels a little bit sporty to me. It, to me is almost a little bit at odds with the watch, especially since it's mainly brushed instead of polished. And deployments can be hit or miss. They do add a lot of bulk, um, but they do pull on the life of the strap and it is there on most luxury watches. So it's kind of, you know, you either love it or you hate it. But the deployment is well done, push button. Uh, the strap itself is very comfortable, very pliable, even after very little wear, uh, very nice matte coloration to it so it doesn't shine out and feel too dressy. It is just a really well executed watch and surprisingly the kind of OEM pairing I think is actually almost perfect already. Looking at the watch from the side there again you do have that kind of beveled edge which almost disappears into the wrist depending on how tight you wear the watch and it is just very comfortable very flat on the wrist it is just a very nice shape on the wrist it feels very ergonomic it feels like it conforms to the top of your wrist rather than sits on top where some you know more slap sided cases would do that so I love the way this wears it is very comfortable and thankfully because it's a 38 and a half millimeter watch with a relatively thin bezel and a relatively large dial 
you do have a lot of visual space in a relatively small package. So moving on to some other straps here, my first pairing is this very nice, I believe it's called Matte Astral Alligator from Delugs. I did a custom strap so it's non-padded and stitchless, whereas the original I believe is padded, so just keep that in mind. I do like how thin this is and it very much pairs with the dressier feel of the watch rather than, you know, even the standard strap over here has some padding to it. So although it's not bad, I do prefer how slim this feels on the slim watch. You have this very nice light blue tone making the watch a little bit more playful, a little bit more youthful, a little bit more casual, I guess, even though it's still alligator and still can be dressy. And I just think this is a really nice combo. A little bit more of a traditional, I guess you can say, color combo. This is a distressed grained leather from Vario. It does, I think, look pretty great. It plays a little bit off the texture of the dial. And that tone of blue just matches perfectly with the seconds hand uh, and looks a little bit more reserved than the previous color. I think this is an awesome combo, really nice way to dress it down, take it off alligator, but keep it on leather, give it a little bit more of texture in the strap rather than a plain leather grain. Uh, to me, it looks awesome. Very, very nice combo. And you know, I think the strap's around 40 bucks or so, and for that, perfect addition to the watch. Next, we have this little bit more of an oddball canvasy textile type strap. I forget exactly the material, but this is made by Monstrap, so I'll have it linked below. Um, to me, it looks awesome. It does definitely dress down the watch, but it plays off those like subtle golden lighter tones that come out in the dial and of course on the texture itself. The combo I didn't expect to work that well at first, but to me definitely dresses it down, looks pretty cool. Uh, color tone I think is a really nice match. And yeah, I dig the combo for sure. Next we have this brown Babel leather strap, also from Delugs. Really nice subtle grain to it. Uh, and the brown tone I think just works really well with the dial. There we go, another dressed down casual look to it. Uh, and yeah, not a bad combo. And lastly, the classic White Archer silicone strap. I think it looks great. Very nice, fun, summery combo. Really pops, especially when those indices almost turn white depending on the angle. Super comfortable, wears very nice and sleek. Makes it wear very comfortably. If you have any trouble wearing this on leather straps because they don't conform that well, try out rubber and silicone because they do conform pretty readily out of the box and they kind of almost reduce the footprint to as low as it can be. So starting off with pros for the watch, and I think a big pro for the watch is just the dial itself. Not only is it just visually interesting because of the curve to the dial in the hands, but on top of that, I think the texture is done well. There's a good amount of color depth to it, even though it's not very dramatic. And the texture is pretty nice. It's also just nice to see a gray dial in watches. It's not an overly common color, and because it's very color neutral, it's just, is a good uh, addition to almost any watch collection. I think the finishing on this dial also really stands out. The fact that the indices and the hands are fully high polished, it really just shines at you. It grabs the light really well and it does just encapsulate that classic Grand Seiko crazy finishing, crazy shininess. Another big pro for this watch, in my opinion, is the case shape and the thinness of the case shape itself. The case is just a unique shape. It's very circular, it's very rounded, it's very soft in its edges and it's just not something that's traditional. It doesn't have traditional uh, lugs that look welded on or lugs that are really even separate from the case. It's all just one monobody piece. And it's interesting. It just is distinctly a Grand Seiko case design in a way. And lastly, I just think the movement's a big pro. Not only is it a spring drive, so you get that very nice spring drive sweep, you get the crazy accuracy, and it just is awesome. But this spring drive caliber in particular, when you flip it over, again, you get all that hand finishing, you get a very just interesting looking movement, one that's very likely to be different looking from the other movements in your watch box. And I just like how it's done. So moving on to cons, and I don't have many with the watch, but one that I can see is the fact that the texture can be subtle at times. If you're not in direct sunlight, or if you're kind of not glancing at the watch very intently, the texture itself can almost blend into the dial and become just part of the color itself. It's definitely not as three-dimensional as something like the White Birch or the SPJ413, which is more of that kind of flowy, petal-like texture. And it almost uh, sucks a little bit. It's nice to see a more defined texture kind of almost quote-unquote see what you're paying for very directly and not have to enjoy it with something like a loop. And my only other real gripe with the watch is the deployment that it comes with is a little large. It's not very sleek, it's not very thin, it almost kind of is as thick as the watch in itself in a way. Uh, so if they could refine that a little bit, make it slimmer, make it thinner, or just put it on a uh, pin buckle, 
that wouldn't be terrible. Of course, maybe uh, it would shave a little bit off the price or maybe not feel as refined, but at least it would wear thinner and wear better. So final thoughts on this watch, and honestly, I do really like it. I've always loved the watches from Grand Seiko that kind of fit in this series of this case shape with the manual wind movement. They're pretty thin without being you know, paper thin and not feeling robust, but still thin enough to where it's a very elegant case shape and a very elegant wearing experience. I love the movement finishing, I love the spring drive technology, I love the execution on the dial, I like that they moved the power reserve from the front to the back just to make it a little bit cleaner, a little bit dressier, uh, and really there isn't much I can say bad about the watch. Is it perfect? Not by any means. Again, if it was my money, I probably wouldn't buy this exact watch because I'd want something more aggressive in the texture department. I'd want something a little bit more, uh, with more impact as I'm looking at it. And Maybe some people don't want that. Maybe they do want that subtlety to reign a little bit more supreme, and as they look closer and closer and closer, more details appear, which is a very, very valid way to enjoy the watch as well. I really would like to see Grand Seiko keep iterating and expand on this watch range with more things in this manual wind movement because it not only looks good, takes up a big proportion of the case back, and again, just wears very well. But I also think this is one of the watches where when you boil it down to its parts is almost one of the most Grand Seiko Grand Seikos. It has spring drive expressed in a very simple, uh, almost uniquely Japanese way. And at the end of the day, it has an aesthetic that isn't like any other watch out there. So it can not only grab every point that is Grand Seiko and Grand Seiko's heritage and Grand Seiko's uh, brand DNA, but also be included in your watch box and not step on the toes of other things. Those are just my thoughts. Let me know what you think. Thank you as always for watching the video. I hope you got something out of it and I'll see you in another one.